Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark and 19 to 0, Denver 0. So, enough of that. I thought I'd read my book to you guys this afternoon. Uh, we're going to read Poison Power by Dr. John Goffman and uh, Dr. Arthur Tamplin, subtitled The Case Against Nuclear Power Plants. And we are in chapter 6. We're at the very, we only have one page left to read on chapter 6. And then we're going to be in chapter 7. So, chapter 6 is uh, the title of chapter 6 is How Safe Are Nuclear Reactors? The last subtitle in this chapter is Oops, check out my hair. Okay. <clears throat> Accidents in Fast Breeder Reactors. We're at the page at top of page 169. The comments above concerning the water moderated reactors apply even more pertinently to fast breeders. Dr. Edward Teller expressed quite well the concern of many scientists and engineers relative to fast breeders when he wrote in Nuclear News, quote, For the fast breeder to work in its steady state breeding condition, you probably need something like a half a ton of plutonium. In order that it should work economically in a bi sufficiently big power producing unit, it probably needs quite a bit more than one ton of plutonium. I do not like the hazard involved. I suggested that nuclear reactors are a blessing because they are clean. They are clean as long as they function as planned. But if they malfunction in a massive manner, which can happen in principle, they can release enough fission products to kill a tremendous number of people. But if you put together two tons of plutonium in a breeder, one-tenth of one percent of this material could become critical. I have listened to hundreds of analysis of what course a nuclear accident can take. Although I believe it is possible to analyze the immediate consequences of an accident, I do not believe it is possible to analyze and foresee the secondary consequences. In an accident involving a plutonium reactor, a couple of tons of plutonium can melt. I don't think anybody can foresee where one or two or five percent of this plutonium will find itself and how it get and how it will get mixed with some other material. A small fraction of the original charge can become a great hazard. End quote. And that's from Edward Teller. The name of the article is called Fast Reactors, Maybe, in the Nuclear News, in a scientific journal called the Nuclear News, August 21st, 1967. In his book, Careless Atom, Sheldon Novak describes a number of accidents that have occurred with nuclear reactors. One of these occurred at the Fermi reactor, 30 miles from Detroit, Michigan. This is our first and only large-scale fast breeder. In this accident, some of the fuel rods had melted. The situation described above by Dr. Teller had occurred. Mr. Novak quotes Walter J. McCarthy, Jr., Assistant General of the Power Reactor Development Company that owned the reactor, as stating that the possibility of a secondary and very serious accident was a, quote, terrifying thought, unquote. The terrifying thought involved the possibility of the melted fuel reassembling into a critical mass and resulting in an explosion that could lead to the consequences foretold by Dr. Teller. It was a month before careful attempts were begun to remove the damaged fuel elements. When nothing happened, everyone breathed a sigh of relief. Dr. Teller says, So far we have been extremely lucky. But is Dr. Jordan's statement that the risk, quote, is certainly worth it, unquote, really true? How safe and reliable are nuclear power reactors? Apparently, no one really knows. The United States is engaged in a gigantic experiment. The stakes which each individual must gamble in this experiment may be extremely high, possibly even his life. Wow. Chapter 7 Nuclear Electricity and the Citizens' Rights Every aspect 
of the Determined Public Relations Campaign of the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, and the electric utility industry shows an infringement on the rights of U.S. citizens. The misuse of public funds for this purpose should raise the eyebrow of even the most cynical observer. In the Declaration of Independence are the following historic words, quote, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Unquote. It is becoming increasingly clear that our democratic rights to the pursuit of happiness in the form of a livable environment are being seriously curtailed. It is no secret that we face an environmental crisis of deep proportions because technological developments have resulted in massive pollution of our air, our land, our streams, our rivers, and our oceans. It is no secret that electrical electric power generation is a major offender. Not only does the generation of electricity pollute in a serious excuse me, let me say that again. Not only does the generation of electricity pollute in a serious and direct way, it also provides the power for a host of additional industries which pollute massively. Platitudes abound from the electric utility industry and the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission concerning electric power, quote, needs, unquote. Facts are curiously lacking. Instead of a painstaking analysis of how increasing electric power delivery was to be used, the dogma was advanced that electric production must increase 10% per year as it did for several years far, far into the future. Projections of this, at least to the year 2000, are commonplace. This dogmatic projection in the, abs in the total absence of any rational examination represents a national disgrace. We're living through that right now, folks. Clichés of such power means progress or we need more cheap electric power or growth is the cornerstone of civilization are quite shop-worn and over, overtly dangerous for the continued existence of life on Earth. But no forum has been open to consider the issue of optimum electric power production. The electric utility industry and the Atomic Energy Commission have been conducting a joint public relations campaign to sell the 10% annual growth in electric power production as a magical requirement of existence. And they pay for the campaign with public funds. This misuse of taxpayer funds by AEC is a scandal. The AEC admits doubling its public relations staff from 35 to 70 full-time public relations people to quote sell unquote, the atom. Instead, the AEC and the electric utility industry should be sponsoring a serious public forum on the subject of electric power requirements. Indirectly, the electric utility industry is using tax money to brainwash the public through ads in national magazines, TV spots, etc., what funds the utility expend on are regarded as part of their tax deductible cost. The public pays for these in addition to the regular charges it pays to, to provide a profit for the utilities. So two groups, the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission and its Congressional Joint Committee patrons and the utility industry and the electric utility industry, both promote their wares with an apparent disregard for the public's right to understand and participate in a meaningful debate and decision con in a meaningful debate and decision concerning electric power requirements. That's a mouthful. 
Both promote their wares with an apparent disregard for the public's right to understand and participate in a meaningful debate and decision concerning electric power requirements. This represents blatant disenfranchisement of the public. Use of public funds for propaganda without any public participation. The inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are even more seriously infringed upon by the development of nuclear electricity with its rash proliferation. Very few citizens are aware of two major ways this comes about. For many Americans, the purchase of a home is an important step in their, first, in their pursuit of happiness. And because of the risk to that happiness inherent in a loss of their home, Americans are accustomed to buying home insurance to protect that crucial investment of life savings. Little known to most Americans is the presence of a, quote, nuclear exclusion clause in their homeowner's insurance policy. A typical set of nuclear exclusion clauses from a homeowner's policy issued by the Hartford Insurance Group, one of the largest and most reliable insurance companies, is as follows. Number two, nuclear clause, section one. The word fire in this policy and endorsements attached here to is not intended and does not embrace nuclear reaction or nuclear radiation or radioactive contamination, all whether controlled or uncontrolled, and lost by nuclear reaction or nuclear radiation or nuclear contamination is not intended to be and is not insured against by this policy and or said endorsements, whether such loss be direct or indirect, proximate or remote, be in whole or in part caused by, contributed to, or aggravated by fire or any other perils insured against by this policy or said endorsements. However, subject to the foregoing and all provisions of this policy, direct loss of fire resulting from nuclear radiation or n nuclear radiation or radioactive contamination is insured against by this policy. Subject to the foregoing and all provisions of this policy, direct loss by, quote, fire resulting from nuclear... Okay, what does that mean? Fuck. That's an insurance policy for you. Nuclear exclusion. That's the nuclear clause. Number one, this policy does not insure against loss by nuclear reaction and nuclear radiation and radioactive contamination, whether all controlled or uncontrolled, or due to any act or condition incident of any of the foregoing, whether such loss be direct or indirect, proximate or remote, or be in part caused by, contributed to, or aggravated by any of the perils insured against by this policy, and nuclear reaction and re or nuclear radiation or radioactive contamination, all whether controlled or uncontrolled, is not, quote, explosion or, quote, smoke. This clause applies to all perils insured against hereunder except the perils of fire and lightning, which are otherwise provided for in the nuclear clause contained above. Many citizens are under the illusion that such exclusions apply to the nuclear war. Nothing could be further from the truth. If a nuclear electricity plant or any of its necessary related activities, transport, fuel cleaning, or waste disposal, resulted in radioactive contamination of one's home. These, nu these nuclear exclusion clauses in homeowner policies mean the citizen may lose the investment of his home, even though he has taken the wise precaution of buying insurance. The astounded citizen might ask why the insurance industry seems fit to make special exclusion of nuclear or radioactivity damage to his home. The insurance industry does not add a premium for coverage against radioactivity or nuclear damage. They just refuse to insure. What nuclear or radioactive damage worries the insurance companies? Is it nuclear war? Hardly. For if it were, they could readily so specify in the policy. Clearly, the insurance industry, known for carefully protecting its profits, has taken a very definite notice of the burgeoning nuclear electric power industry. It is obvious 
that it doesn't like what it sees at all. This lack of confidence in the safety of nuclear electricity industry is expressed by the nuclear exclusion clauses in homeowners' policies. Underwriters refuse to risk dollars on the fail-safe formula developed for the nuclear electricity industry. Considering the insurance industry's long history as a profit maker, the public would be well advised to take heed of this extreme skepticism. The insurance companies saw the nuclear electricity industry as a hazard and it moved quickly to protect themselves. The public is denied a similar opportunity. Uh, I'm going to stop here. We're on page 177 and I can't wait to get to the next chapter. It's the constitutionality, the constitutionally questionable Price Anderson Act. And oh boy, I can't wait to read that because that is really the meat and potatoes of why we're super screwed, the Price Anderson Act. So I'll end here, you guys. Uh, put your courage feet on, please. Please take action. And, uh, um, you know, you can buy this book. You don't have to listen to me read it. <laughs> you, might, you might get more out of it if you read it yourself. But I'm going to keep pursuing it for those people that can't read. This is valuable information. Please take action. Call Governor Jay Nixon, Claire McCaskill, uh, Roy Blunt, your own two senators, and tell them that we need action in St. Louis. We need them to protect the people of St. Louis and move them out, regardless of the Price-Anderson Act. It does not matter. The EPA has responsibility to protect the people of St. Louis since they failed to allow the company to do the cleanup and upgrade as early, I think, as the 80s. The 80s and the 60s, they, they sold it in the 60s, and in the 80s, the company asked the EPA to please, they wanted to upgrade and do a, a site cleaning, and the EPA said, no, there's grass growing, that's good enough. So now we have these people almost uh, close to a fire of nuclear waste in St. Louis. So please get up to speed on that if you don't know about it, but um, it's, it's the Westlake landfill in St. Louis. You can just Google it. Ciao, you guys. Put your courage feet on. Bye.